Uh, so the next speaker needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway. Uh, we will have the pleasure of listening to Bruce Wilkie from Blizzard Entertainment. Bruce, are you with us? Can you hear us? I can. I'm here. Awesome. Good to hear. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Fine, thank you. It's been a little bit rainy here in Khabda, but we're doing great. <laughs> I'm going to leave the stage to you. Big, uh, big round of applause for Bruce. Thank you. All right. Hello, and thanks for joining me. My name is Bruce Wilkie, and I work on the Overwatch team at Blizzard Entertainment as an engine programmer. For those of you that haven't heard of Overwatch, it's a 6v6 team-based first-person shooter. In Overwatch, the heroes are front and center, the stars of the show. And today we'll be looking at the pipeline heroes go through on their journey to becoming a playable character. A couple of points that I wanna talk about before we start our trip. We'll be touching on a variety of topics here today. The pipeline has many parts and some of these parts are large and complex. Because our time here is limited, I've made this talk more of a roadmap and not a how-to. As much as I'd like to cover each of these topics in depth, we just simply won't have the time for that today. But like any good map, I've tried to provide directions along the way on how you can get more information about topics that interest you, often linking to other talks, presentations, and websites that you can use to dive deeper. Most of the talks are from other Overwatch team members so the information will be easily relatable to what you're gonna to see today. I've roughly broken the pipeline down into three stages. In general, the transitions aren't as clean cut as this when we're making a hero. But for this talk, I'll try to present an idealized workflow, what we generally aim for. We're gonna start talking about pre-production and what goes on in that stage. We'll then move on to production when most of the assets for the heroes are actually made. And then we'll finish up talking about how we ship a hero and everything that goes into making a hero finally playable for the community. With all that said, let's start our journey. And our journey starts here with an idea. A hero always starts with an idea, but not every idea starts from the same source. A character can have such an impact on the lore of Overwatch that being a playable hero just feels right. Doomfist was an example of this. He was featured in the start of our opening cinematic. He's been larger than life in the Overwatch lore for a long time. Anna is another example of a hero that came from the lore. Her original prototype was actually very different. It was more of an alchemist type character. But once the team saw how important Anna was to the story of Overwatch, design changed direction and created Anna's kit. Sometimes a piece of concept art can be so compelling to the team that we just know we have to take it further. Hammond is really a great example of this. It was love at first sight when the team saw his first concept art and we knew right away that we wanted to make the little hamster in the ball. And then finally, at times, the design group will identify a need in the game, and we need to create a hero to fill that gap. There's been a number of heroes like this over the years. Orissa, Sigma, and Baptiste are all examples of ideas that started from a design need in the game. The group doing this step is generally very small, just a handful of developers, really, uh, sometimes it can be as little as five or six people doing this initial concept phase. I've linked a behind the scenes look at the creation of Doomfist. It offers great insight into the concept phase of the heroes and the thinking that goes into all this initial step. So we have our concept, that's all good and fine. Some preliminary work has probably been done in that previous stage on, on gameplay, but now it's really the time to make the prototype. This will be a larger group and it's gonna be more cross-functional as well. It will still generally be small, uh, sometimes no more than 15 developers here. 
This group will be making the initial core of the hero. Gameplay will be created in our in-house scripting system. We call it state script. It's a node-based visual scripting system with a C++ backend. The graphs are created in our internal tool, TED. I've linked a wonderful GDC presentation here that goes into great depth about state script for anyone who's interested. It covers the why and the how of state script, and it goes on to talk about how the team uses state script to make our weapons and abilities in Overwatch. Models will also be prototyped here. Now, the focus is not on looks. Obviously, Farah in-game looks much better than this. But really, what we're trying to shoot for here is we're trying to get the silhouette right. We're trying to make sure the hero will stand out in combat and to make sure that the 2D concept art is something that we can transition properly into 3D, something that can be rigged, something that can be animated. Rough animations will also be prototyped once the blockout model is rigged up. I've linked a presentation here that goes in depth on the initial animation work that was involved when making our hero May. Finally, uh, VFX will be prototyped in this step as well. Hanzo's Dragon Strike was a great example of, of one of my favorite VFX prototypes. It's really just a collection of spheres. That, that's all it was. We used to call it the caterpillar. Uh, but it, it conveyed well the gameplay and the intent of the ability. Uh, unfortunately, it also killed frame rate since it was a grouping of large transparent spheres that went across the map. Uh, but it's prototype. We weren't really worried about frame rate. A variety of tools are used when we're creating this prototype content. The modelers will pretty much use whatever tools they're comfortable with. Uh, Maya will be used for any of the rigging and the animation. Our internal tool, TED, will be used for all the state script uh, and for making the VFX prototypes. I've linked an interview that talks a little bit more about TED and some of the different content we create using it. The first stage of the pipeline is really about finding the fun of the hero. Feedback is very, very important here, not only for making sure that the hero is going to feel great, that the hero is going to feel unique, but also for making sure that the team feels like we can actually make this hero. The pipeline is very long, and the further a hero travels down the pipeline, the harder and, more importantly, the more expensive changes become. A great way to get that feedback is by playtesting the hero. Our lead tools programmer gave a great GDC talk about the culture the team has built around playtesting, and I've linked that here. When thinking about your own content creation pipelines, I would really encourage you to playtest everything. Something that feels great with the simplest of assets, like Mr. Stickman here, who was actually a prototype in the game, it's a good indication that an idea is working. For some great examples of all the things that we prototyped when making Overwatch, I've linked a talk Jeff Kaplan and Arnold Sang did at BlizzCon. It's worth a look to get some ideas on how simple prototypes can be, but also how effective they can be. You can really see the game start to take shape over time by watching the progress of the various prototypes that the team worked on. Before we leave stage one, I want to call out something that, while not part of the hero pipeline, it's very critical to it, and that's importing and building data. We have terabytes of source data for Overwatch. That source data builds into millions of assets. Multiple builds are done every day across multiple development branches. I've linked a very detailed GDC talk that goes deep into the different parts of data building that make all this possible. It's highly recommended for anyone who's interested in how to support all the data that goes into making a game like Overwatch. When we talk about importing data, our two main primary DCCs are Maya and Photoshop. For Maya, we have a custom C++ exporter and it's coupled with a large amount of Python code. For Photoshop, 
we use com interop via C sharp plugin coupled with JavaScript commands for extracting a bunch of data from the Photoshop layer stack. On to production. We have our prototype. It's been signed off by the team as being viable, something that they think we can make. So it's time to start making the real content. This will be an even larger group than the prototyping group. This can often go up to 40 developers or so, all working, trying to make this hero real. Models and textures come first. We first do a high poly sculpt uh, made in something like ZBrush or Mudbox, whichever the artist working on it is more familiar with. I've linked an art dump from our lead character artist that contains images to these sculpts, so you can get an idea of the detail they contain. Once the high poly sculpt is done, a low poly model is then created in Maya. Now the focus here is on getting the topology right, making sure that the character can deform well and has the structure to support the future, future animations we'll be making. To get an idea of the difference between the high poly and the low poly models, I've linked a dump of the low poly models that a community member made via data mining our assets. Textures are then created. Here, several different tools are used, uh, some having very specific purposes. For example, when we're painting flow maps for our hair shader, we'll use something like Mari, or some of the artists even use Krita for that. For baking high poly to low poly normal maps, the team tends to use Marmoset. Throughout this process, artists are held to strict budgets because you're getting this tour from an engine programmer, you'll hear me stress over and over again how much budgets matter. Some of our platforms have very tight performance constraints, both in memory and CPU performance. So it's really important to hit these targets. For Overwatch, we target around 30,000 triangles for hero geometry and around 15,000 triangles for weapons and accessories. Texture memory should come around to about 30 megs after compression. Now this includes textures that we use for visual effects, which we'll talk about uh, in a couple slides. For Overwatch 2 and targeting next gen consoles, we're actually bumping this up a little bit. We're looking to try and double the triangle count and hopefully we can have 4K textures, but that's still something we're looking at. The graphics engine we created for Overwatch supports a number of material types, and characters tend to use them all. I'll very briefly go over these, but please feel free to ask me more about them in our Q&A session afterwards if there's something that interests you here. For organics, we support hair. Uh, it has a multi-highlight modified anisotropic GGX material. Uh, for skin, Overwatch uses a form of pre-integrated skin shading, while on Overwatch 2, we've changed and are moving more towards a screen space subsurface scattering approach. The eye shader in Overwatch uh, is going to be a new physically inspired refraction material. We support a bunch of fabrics as well. We have a custom BRDF for denim, wool, and velvet. Uh, things like leather and shiny silk are done using our standard BRDF. We support a lot of dielectrics as well, wood, plastic, stone. You'd be surprised what characters are made of. Uh, for metals, uh, characters often have metal in some form, uh, armor, weapons, whatnot. Chrome, steel, gold, those are some, some of the examples. For our metals, we use uh, heavily image-based reflections. They play a large part in this. Our metalness property isn't a Boolean, and that's done on purpose. We like to try and support some futuristic materials tool uh, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to say are simply metal or simply dielectric. And finally, we have a glass shader. Uh, it can support tinted glass like you see in Tracer's goggles here. It can also have a diffuse layer if you want things like scratched glass or dirty glass. I've linked two great talks here. One is from our lead graphics programmer that goes in depth into the inner workings of the engine. 
complete with performance numbers, uh, the tools and techniques we used when creating the engine. The second talk is very exciting. It's all about character rendering. It's given by a couple of the developers that worked on the Call of Duty franchise. I've used this talk and accompanying paper repeatedly as inspiration for character rendering in Overwatch and Overwatch 2. A statue isn't very heroic, so the next step after modeling is actually getting the hero to move. Hero motion in Overwatch can be made using keyframes, inverse kinematics, cloth, and ragdoll simulation. I've linked a GDC presentation here by one of our principal animators on the team that dives deep into the animation process and technology we use in rigging and animating our heroes. Budgets matter here too. CPU simulation time and animation memory used, which often translates directly into load time. The engine has a hard cap of 1024 bones total for a hero. It just can't go over that or we simply won't render the hero. We try and target under 500 simulation bones. And this isn't to say we actually simulate 500 bones every frame. What we do is that's considered a virtual budget and different simulation types cost different amounts of that virtual budget. A cloth sim bone, for example, that's pretty cheap. We can, we can sim a number of those. A physics-based joint with collision and other constraints, that's more expensive. So that ends up taking more of that virtual bone budget. Being a first-person shooter means that the player is generally looking at first-person animations constantly in gameplay. These animations require some extra care and feeding. And I've linked a talk that goes into detail on the extra effort the 1P animations receive. An interesting bit of trivia for the graphics programmers in the group, the engine reserves about 10% of the depth buffer for the 1P view models. You can see this here in Mercy's pistol. It's right up next to the wall, like I've jammed Mercy right into the wall here. Yet in the depth buffer, they are very distant. This is great for preventing view models from clipping into the world. Unfortunately, this presents many challenges when using several rendering techniques like screen space local reflections and screen space ambient occlusion that rely on a continuous depth buffer. So we've had to take that into account when working on those techniques. Our hero is doing great on their journey. They're looking good and moving well. But now it's time for some real polish. The effects kit of a hero is integral to the gameplay of the hero. Abilities come to life through both visual and sound effects. Tasked with effectively and clearly communicating gameplay visually, our VFX artists use a wider range of techniques and tools to get the job done. They often work very closely with design and gameplay programmers to make sure effects are accurate, readable, and impactful. Sometimes a good amount of back and forth is needed between the VFX team and design. Roadhog's hook is a great example of this. It took a great deal of iteration to get that feeling right between all the groups involved. Some of the tools here are very specific to VFX. Things like After Effects and Houdini are used to pre-render Flipbook's textures. We use our internal tool, TED, for creating emitters, timelines, and custom shading graphs that we use in all our VFX. Footsteps, bullet whiz bys impact sounds of all types. Sounds are the other side of the effects equation. Jesse Shell once said, about game audio, sound is what truly convinces the mind it is in a place. In other words, hearing is believing. On Overwatch, we use the Wise Sound Engine, and you can learn all about that integration in the first talk I've linked here, Game Audio Using Wise. The second link is a GDC talk our audio director and principal audio programmer gave that goes in depth into the use of sound in Overwatch is very recommended for learning about some of the non-obvious topics related to game audio. And just as visual disciplines have specific tools for creating content, so does audio. 
I am not a sound guy, so I don't actually know what all these tools do, but I've listed some of them here. And our internal tool, TED, also is used for importing audio. Again, budgets matter here. For audio, we try to make sure that the hero takes no more than 17 megs total for the audio data. This is again done for load time. We need to make sure heroes can load quickly during gameplay. As mentioned earlier, the budget for VFX is shared with the 30 megs allocated for textures. By this point in production, the hero will be looking, moving, and sounding well. But no hero is complete without progression content. These are the items that players unlock via loot boxes in Overwatch. I've listed the counts of different types of progression content we have here. The scope of effort needed to create that much content is truly daunting. It just wouldn't be possible for us to do that without great collaboration from multiple art outsourcing teams. Our outsourcing partners are well integrated into the Hero Pipeline. Using the same tools, including our internal tool, TED, that our own artists use. I've linked the ArtStation site of Airborne Studios as an example of some of the high quality content that our outsourcing partners create. Again, budgets always matter. Play the game intros, we try to keep to no more than seven and a half megs. And that includes any animations, any props, and all the VFX that are specific to that play of the game intro. Skins follow the same budget as the base hero, and we limit the number of equipped emotes, sprays, and voice lines that a hero can have during the match. This is all done to save memory and to make sure that our PVP experience is smooth and uninterrupted by loading times. I wanna talk very briefly about the impact of the Overwatch League on the hero pipeline. In the Overwatch League, each team has unique colors and logos and each hero can apply those differently. The pipeline had to be expanded to create broadcast quality versions of hero skins using different textures and very special shaders. In addition, we also had to make in-budget versions of those skins available to fans. To count, there's over 700 skins right now just for the Overwatch League, and it's still rising. I'd be happy to talk about more of some of those techniques and how we did that in our Q&A session later, if there's time and people are interested. Our heroes made it out of production it's officially time to join the roster of playable heroes. This final stage of the pipeline has the highest number of developers yet, and it can be a flurry of activity across multiple supporting groups. During production, the game team will be doing daily play tests all the time on the hero. But at this stage now, the quality assurance group will start testing the hero extensively on all the platforms that we ship on. All heroes go to the public test region before going to the live environment. <clears throat> this is usually broken up into two PTR patches, the base hero and progression content. These PTR patches are very popular with the community and consistently drive the highest PTR concurrency. Launch content will need to be made and deployed which can take some time, uh, perhaps even starting back when the hero is still in production. I've linked a behind the scenes look at the Alive cinematic. Higher polygon models, custom animations, and new effects were all assets that needed to be created specifically for the cinematics. Overwatch supports 13 different languages. Not only does the sound for the hero have to be localized, but so too does all the launch content. I've linked a community made video that shows the first part of the infiltration cinematic localized into all the languages that the game supports. It really highlights how much effort goes into the localization of Overwatch. The Overwatch website contains a wealth of information for each hero and each time a new hero joins, this content must be created. And finally, our community team engages with our players on multiple social media platforms to raise awareness and excitement for the hero's launch. 
While the launch of the Hero is officially the end of the Hero pipeline, it's certainly not the end of the work associated with the Hero. Overwatch is a live game. And to date, we have created over 400, uh, 100 patches in the last four years. The servers for Overwatch consistently send game telemetry back to the team, informing designers on what's working and what's not working for any given hero. Live support coupled with this data reporting means our heroes are always evolving. Bastion, Symmetra, and Torbjorn are just a few examples of heroes being substantially changed after we ship them. In the case of Symmetra, new abilities can not only mean new assets, but also new engine features that support the changes. For example, you know your day is going to be interesting when design asks, what about a transparent wall that goes across the entire map? Alongside tuning and evolving heroes, new progression and event content is continually added. In the case of new skins, these follow much of the pipeline we just traveled through, concept to production, here are a few of the new skins we've just released as part of our Halloween event. And here, for example, you can see Brigida is actually using a stone material. It's great to see the variation of materials and the creativity our artists come up with when making skins for the heroes. We made it. We're at the end of our journey, and I hope you've enjoyed it. We've gone through the three stages of the hero creation pipeline in Overwatch. Pre-production saw an idea come to life and get vetted against the team as something that can be made. The production stage followed next with many developers, both internal and external, creating assets for the hero. And finally, we followed the hero into the launch stage and beyond as they joined the roster of playable heroes in Overwatch. Many people and many teams come together to make this happen. It's inspiring every time I see it. If Zarya was a game developer, she would definitely say, together, we can make a great game. And then finally, a quick note, Blizzard is always looking for great talent. I've linked the career page on our website and provided a couple email addresses that you can reach out to for more information about careers at Blizzard. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Bruce. Round of applause. Cool, thank you for that. We have some time for questions, which is great. Uh, so I'm gonna take one right away here that we have on Discord. Uh, so Bruce, do you ever take diversity into account when creating characters? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the team, hopefully, uh, the record can speak for itself. We try to make sure that we have many different body types, uh, our many different ethnicities. Uh, when you when you look at the lineup of Overwatch, hopefully you will find uh, you know something that you can relate to, something that really speaks to you, and we work hard to make sure that that's the case. That's really great. We have a question here in the audience. So I will repeat the question. So do you have many game writers? Uh, and like, how does the game writing come into the process of making characters, if I understand the question correctly? Uh, sure. Uh, we have writers on the team. And we also have the uh, story and franchise department in Blizzard. Uh, they, they're the ones that you know work on the backstory, that create the lore of Overwatch. Uh, like I said, the ideas for Heroes, for example, there's a number of heroes that have come directly from uh, the lore of Overwatch, from the from the work of these writers. You know, 76, I didn't mention him, but he's another great example where he almost entirely came from the lore. You know, the writers wrote him into the backstory of Overwatch and everything he did. And the team was just like, yeah, he makes sense. We need to make him a playable character. That's really cool. Uh a question from Discord. How is it to work with a timeline? I guess when you're on a schedule, uh, when you have like uh, a time a time limit. Yeah, that's uh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> I won't lie. You know, some some of these heroes, for example, can can really take um, a long time. 
when you look at the back and forth that has to happen, you know, I focused on, on feedback and iteration and play tests. That is not a quick process. And so when we're, when we're looking at some of these heroes, uh, we have to plan very far in advance. So when you look at the timelines and you say, okay, it's gonna take us three or four months to make a hero, we know that we need to, if we want new heroes for, uh, and new skins for an event, like the Halloween event, we know that we have to get those in the pipeline months and months in advance. Uh, so really the, the best thing I can say there is try to have your producers who are just a critical part of that process Try to make sure they're aware of the timeframes that the team needs to make the assets and make sure that they give you enough time so you're not crunched in that timeline. Cool. Uh, when do you know that the game needs to be delayed rather than release it before it's fully done? Well, as an engine programmer, uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say when something is done. Uh, you know, I, I look at pixels every day. So when a pixel is out of place, I'm like, no, we can't ship that yet. You know, we need to, let's, let's fix that, that one pixel. Uh, fortunately, there's other people on the team that, that are much better at making that call than myself. Uh, you know, they'll look at that pixel and say, you know what, that doesn't look so bad. We can go with that. Uh, but at other times, you know, some, something just isn't working. Like if, uh, you know, if there's a game mode or there's, uh, you know, a bunch of abilities on a hero, for example, that, that the team just, it play tests and, you know, we think it's okay, but it's, it's just really not amazing. Then that's when we'll start looking at, you know, maybe, maybe we need to delay something, you know, maybe when we're talking about heroes, for example, we'll say, well, maybe this hero isn't going to be able to make this patch, you know, maybe we need to push it out actually a couple patches. Uh, so really it, it comes down to when, not just when you know you think it's perfect because we're our own worst critics at times, but when the team as a whole kind of feels like something is something is great and we we want the public to see it or know we need to hold something back and we need to delay it. Mm. Uh, I have a question for you as well. Uh, so, like, what does the like future look like from your perspective? Like, what? parts of your your part of development do you want to keep working on and like keep improving on what can you still be better at at blizzard uh yeah when we well talking about overwatch specifically you know the the next gen consoles that are coming out uh which will not be next gen here in, in a number of weeks uh you know those are really exciting right the the features that they have uh some of the performance numbers that they can they can post those are just really amazing. And as, as we look towards the future, we'd really like to understand how to take advantage of some of that stuff and, and how to make uh, the game just look really amazing on those upcoming platforms. Sounds cool. Uh, you're going to join us in a panel now as well. So I'm going to ask a final question. I'm going to segue us a little bit into the next part of this, uh, this conference. Um, so you've been in the industry for 20 years now, and you've been 11 years at Blizzard, right? Uh, so, like, what are some trends that you have seen during your time in industry, and like, do you have any predictions for the future? Uh, yeah, that some. I think if I, if I look back, you know, twenty years ago when when I was working on games, as opposed to to the things I work on now, I would really have to say it's, uh, you know, the hardware is is the thing that you know has changed so much. Um, and that's just had ripple effects throughout everything, right? Like what we create now, the content we create now, there's so much more of it and it's so much more complex. And it's, uh, in my opinion, of course I'm a hardware guy, so obviously I'm biased, but in my opinion, it's, it's you know, really related to the advances we've had in gaming hardware and what these platforms are capable of. My phone is, for example, so much better of a platform for playing games than you know, the PCs even that we had 20 years ago. So it's really just amazing to see how far that stuff's come. Yeah, definitely. We have another question from Discord. Which stage of the character creation do you enjoy the most? And also, which one is your favorite hero? <laughs> uh, if I had to pick a favorite hero, it would be Mercy. I uh, played Mercy almost exclusively in, in some of our very, very early game prototypes. Uh, 
you know, I love playing healers. Uh, I, I play WoW a whole bunch, World of Warcraft, and I always play uh, healer types. So Mercy was a natural fit for me. And I think, you know, Moira is pretty good right now as a healer, but I still really enjoy Mercy. Um, as far as what part of the pipeline is my favorite, uh, you know, as a tech guy, I, I really enjoy the production phase. There's a lot of back and forth there between the artists and, and engineering. You know, they'll come to us and say, well, what, what do you think about this? You know, can we actually, you know, do this special effect? Can we make a shader change to, to you know, get something that looks just a little bit better? Um, that's that kind of back and forth and that interaction, that's, that's really enjoyable for me and I like that. Cool. Now I have a really long question for you here. Let's see if I can read it all. You mentioned some things like cloth being cheap and therefore taking up little budgets. Well, constrained joints and collision can take up more budgets. Does this budget get allocated according to visual importance or is it used more to throttle the more expensive behaviors across the board? Yeah, so the idea behind, behind our virtual bone budget is to make sure we don't have any one hero that will spike up the CPU simulation time uh, because you know, let, let's say we had one hero that was super expensive in simulation time, and then the rest of the heroes were all cheap. So that would be fine in some of our game modes, but in other game modes where people can pick the same hero, then, you know, that would, we would just blow out our CPU sim budget. So we can't do that. So that's why we have, <clears throat> we have those budgets in place. And, and as you say, they kind of, they kind of throttle things uh, overall. But that's that's by design again, because when when you have twelve of that one hero on screen, you need to make sure that the budgets are relatively the same across the heroes, so you don't end up spiking your CPU sim time. For sure. How do you keep yourself motivated in such a long-term project? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it it really helps to uh, really be engaged with the genre of game you're making. And I think uh, hopefully that speaks for itself in, in the final product of Overwatch, not just myself, but the, uh, almost everyone on the team is really uh, into the first person shooter genre. Uh, you know, we all enjoy team-based games highly. And so when you're working on something like Overwatch that took years to make, and then has been in support for years as well, uh, you know, it really helps to really love the game and to really love the genre that you're working on. Hmm. And I think that's a big part of staying motivated is, you know, finding your passion, finding what you're passionate about. And for me, it's engine programming, it's, it's creating characters like this and working on a first person shooter. So all that means that, you know, I'm super excited to keep working on Overwatch, even though, you know, as, as, as you say, I've been working on it a number of years now. Hmm. Thank you so much for your answers. Uh, round of applause for that. And we're going to bring up some other guests up on the stage, or one is going to be joining me physically up on stage. Yes, please come join us. Uh, and we're also going to have one more guest that's going to join us on link. So, yeah, uh, so you're free to sit down there to be us. And we're going to have Snut joining us over link as well, over Zoom. Let's see if. We are all present. There you are. Amazing. So I'm going to jump over here to the chair here, get a little bit more comfortable. And let's let's see who we have here in this panel now. So Tobias, maybe you can start by introducing yourself. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Tobias, uh, uh, and I've been working with um, Stanlock Studios for my m most of my career. And I started my own company with uh, a friend, Klaus, who was here earlier on the panel. Uh, and we've been working on our new game for about a year, and I always like try to push something new. So I guess that's why I got invited here. So yeah, but uh, new stuff is the cool stuff. So new stuff is the cool stuff. That's that's the and you know topic of this panel. Um, yeah, just, I'm you know, a programmer, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Snoot, maybe you can tell us who you are. So my name is Snoot. I'm a community manager at Coffee Stain Studios currently, uh, and I've worked in the industry for a couple of years. And before I was a community manager, I was a programmer, and I've also worked as a producer and level designer. And I worked on small games, big games, uh, console games, PC games, and uh, right now we are working on Satisfactory. Cool. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Um,
Bruce, you already touched upon this. I already kind of asked you this question already, but let's iterate a little bit. Uh, so you've been in the industry for a while. So what do you think has been the greatest uh, revolution in making games during this time? Yeah, for as far as making games, I think, uh, you know, I would probably have to say that some of the commercial game engines that, that we have today now, if you if you look at something like Unity or something like UE4, you know, that's that's really opened up, I think, a lot of uh, ability for people to make games, to experiment making games, and to kind of get their ideas, you know, out up on the screen and, and to see what others think about them. You know, it didn't used to be like that. Uh, you know, you used to have to code your own engine, you had to use to write your own animation systems, uh, all that kind of stuff. And and nowadays you, you can just use Unity or you can use UE4. And I, I think that's really great for opening up the field and getting more people uh, to try out ideas and new things. Cool. Question for everyone in the panel. What do you think is the next thing for game tech? Do you want to start, Tobias? Uh, so one thing that I don't know much about yet, but I've seen some examples of it used, uh, is like uh, leveraging machine learning to generate content. Uh, and like I'm not enough in uh, knowledgeable about it to know w how far away it is or wh where it's right now. I, probably a lot of it is behind closed doors because it's but, but I see that as something that's, uh, th that can really take a certain kind of games to a completely different level because, you know, you can, like, have your set pieces and then, like, literally draw some br broad stro uh, strokes and then have an AI that, like, yeah, here you go, here's your fill in the rest of it. And that might, for me, as uh, somebody who's, like, take who hasn't worked with environment at all, almost, that feels to me like a complete rev revolution. But uh, like I said, I don't really know much about it, So, but that's something I see in the future that might do something really good with the industry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What do the rest of you think? Yeah, that's something that I've been looking for for a long time. Because uh, I made that reflection the other day when I was using Photoshop, like Photoshop has done so many great advancements in terms of like the auto fill stuff and like you can like draw boxes and you can like oh it figure out that you want to select a person and then can completely remove the background and stuff like that and i'm waiting for that to like move over to like our 3d tools more so like you'd be able to say if you're making a chicken or something you're like i want to have a feather effect on it and you can just like automatically get that done because there has been like a bunch of tools made for various games. I know for uh, the division, for instance, they made a procedural tool for like when they're dragging out buildings, it would automatically like generate you know windows and populate like balconies and stuff like that. Uh, so it just like gives artists better tools to uh, to like do the thing that is important, which is like getting the composition out, so to speak, and then let the computer kind of fill in the details. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. When that happens, which I think is very soon, it becomes way better. Yeah, I think there's, you know, machine learning has ha, has a lot of implications on on you know so much of what we do. Uh, DLSS is is really amazing when you look at some of the stuff that that Nvidia can do with that technique. It's super exciting to think we could actually have higher performance by rendering lower resolution images, but to the end user, they look amazing because, you know, a machine learning algorithm has upsampled them in, in a way that's so much better than, you know, we would do uh, on our own. And, and I think we can apply machine learning to the pipeline too. You know, we've, we've kind of played around with some different techniques. Uh, you know, when you're filtering textures, maybe is there a way you can, you can train a, a machine learning network to, to go ahead and actually make a better downsampling filter for your MIPS, for example. Like there's just so much that we could use that technology for. And we're really, we're really just kind of at the start of figuring out what it can do for us. It's certainly exciting. Yeah. I actually, since uh, um, um, a blizzard person, <laughs> I forgot the name, sorry. Yes. Um, uh, the. Um, I think uh, another part uh, separate from machine learning is like uh, since we are not getting more gigahertz in from our um, 
processors. Uh, there some, seems to be a little bit of a revolution around new types of way to structure uh, structure the performance to get more performance out of games. And like I think Overwatch was made during, f uh, with ECS uh, entity component system and stuff like that. And I, I remember reading that it wasn't entirely for performance reasons or for more or less because he's managed stuff easily uh, in the code. So I just want to hear your opinion. Do you think that will take on a new life with performance-wise? Like, has that, is that a role that it can play? Uh, maybe. I mean, so uh, like ECS is one of the reasons it's so great at performance is because it really it really helps you try and access memory, you know, in, in ways that make sense. Like that's one of its major benefits. Uh, you know, I think there's been some interesting experiments made where, you know, let's let's compile this, this very tight bit of code, uh, you know, many different times and then use, you know, genetic algorithms to kind of figure out which makes the best cache coherency, which makes the most performant code. Uh, you know, maybe there's stuff that we could do in the future uh, like that. Um, yeah. That's a problem. Yeah, because like one thing that made me think of that is like one one example of that is how our compilers have gotten so much better over time as well, like figuring out what the best way is to compile code. And then the, the same way it kind of goes when you do like, for instance, uh, graphics rendering. And like a lot of times when you make custom engines, you make them because you want to fit something specific that you're doing. And like a general problem with you know more generic engines like Unreal Engine or Unity is that they're kind of like one tool that fits all needs. But sometimes if you're making something special, then um, it's harder to make. And this like in the same way that the compiler is smart and like recognize like oh you probably want to pack it this way, so to speak. Like the same way I hope can apply to to general you know technical solutions in games where like if you you if you're making a game where you do need uh, to optimize in a certain way for the game, then the engine would be able to figure that out and optimize for you instead of like trying to reduce the amount of special quirks that you need to take in order to like, be able to, to uh, get a game running in a certain uh, performance and stuff like that. I think, I think really as we look towards the future of performance though, and I, again, this is my opinion, but I, you know, the multi-core stuff, it's, it's just amazing. Like, if, if you look at what Intel and AMD has done in their core counts, it's, uh, you know, from my, from my standpoint, you know, think, thinking back when, when games were all single-threaded and that's what you did because you had a single core, to, to now, you know, we make, on Overwatch, we always try to have uh, at least upwards of eight cores filled on some of these higher-end machines. Like that's just outstanding. That lets us do things like the the simulation for characters at just such a higher level of detail because we have that extra commute, computing power. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's really great to think about how performance is going to change in the future as these core counts go even higher and we can take more advantage of multi-threading. Yeah, hmm. I, I think um, the, the, that was one of the reasons. We are, at, at the game I'm working on, it's using Unity Dots, which is obviously very related to all of this. And uh, I feel like that probably is a bigger deal than people realize, not just Unity Dots or Unity like that, but like having uh, a next, engine, next level engine which allows to unlock all of these cores. Because, I mean, I've manually thread done multi-threaded stuff before, and it's just a crazy hassle of race conditions if you don't know exactly what you're doing. And I think that's a big leap by getting thread safety uh, implied through code structure and engine structure. So, yeah. yeah. We have a question from the audience. So uh, remember that you can ask questions on Discord, and they will pop up there, and I can uh, ask the participants here. So uh, this is a question for Snut. Uh, how big of Big of fans are you, you guys of Metal Gear Solid? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess this is a bit of a random thing. So yesterday we posted like a video that joke. made a big ripple. Yeah, it is kind of inside editor community. Uh, we posted a video yesterday of uh, we're releasing our next like patch next week, and we released a video that was heavily inspired by the climbing sequence in Metal Gear Solid 3. So, and that was me who made that video, so that's me who uh, forced that and everything else. So it sounds like you are big fans. 
Uh, <laughs> I am. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Cool. Uh, so what's your thought on the future of streamed games? Uh, do you think that will, that will be the standard? And if so, when will it be standard? Ooh. I don't even know <laughs> what to say about that. I, I had so much hope for OnLive when they launched and everything just crumbled back then. And I, I've seen so much weird stuff happen with the new platforms. I don't really know, I, actually. That's, that's, that's a tricky one, I think. Yeah. So yeah. Bruce, do you have I idea? have tried Stadia. Like, I'm really impressed with how well Stadia actually worked compared to like what my perception of it would have been. Because um, I've only like used streaming, you know, when you have like local streaming services. So like when you're doing GeForce, uh, not GeForce Now, but the the one before that, NVIDIA, Nvidia Shield. And like when you're developing for a PlayStation, uh, there's a really good streaming tool for uh, the console where you can like play the game on PC and it's running on on the PlayStation hardware. And that's been pretty good. Um, and I was like, there's no way they're going to be able to do that. Or this, I didn't think it would be possible to do it in such an extent. Uh, but I think it comes more down to like the general like architecture of the internet for the world because like stadia works well in sweden because really we, we have really good internet speeds but maybe not so much in the rest of the world like where they're not like up to that speed yet uh maybe in the future it'll get better i mean i, I assume it's going to get better um but i think it depends a little bit on the game because some games it makes the there there will always be a latency i mean there's already a latency when you're playing on your console and like you're playing through the bluetooth uh, interface through the controller to the to the screen, right? And there's like latency from the game into the stream and such like that. So there's always going to be some kind of latency. And then when you add on top like the input latency you get from those type of streaming services, uh, like that's a tough nut to crack. But I wouldn't be surprised if we do crack it, so to speak. Um, but I don't know. Like it, it depends on the game. Like for for RTS games, maybe it makes sense. For first person shooters, it might be trickier. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think uh, at least from a developer standpoint, you want these things to succeed because we put so much time into our min spec efforts. You know, making sure that the game runs great on on lower end machines. Like, imagine the day where we didn't have to do that because people were you know streaming their games and you know the hardware wasn't a concern because we knew they always had you know this minimum level of hardware support. Uh, certainly, we've we've played Overwatch on some of these streaming services, and uh, you know it's it's really great to see what what these things can do. Uh, I kind of agree with your statement, uh, you know, about you need great internet, and you know the world isn't there yet. Like there's places that don't have great internet yet, so you know I think we're still a ways out. But to me personally, it's super exciting to see development in that field. And as a developer, like I said, I can't wait for when MinSpec Will will be a streaming service. Hmm. So do you th you're talking yeah, this about is a really good thing. Yeah. No, please go. Oh, on. sorry. Uh, one really good point. The one really good point there as well is like one one nice thing about developing on console is that you know what you're developing for. Like you, when if you're making a game for PlayStation Four, then if it runs on your place, like on your dev kit, then you know it's going to run on the end product, so to speak. Uh, and that's one thing that would be really cool if we had Streamlight hardware where we know like if we're releasing a game that's going to be streamed, then you kind of are making a game for console and then you don't have to cater for one bajillion different PC setups that will just like make life so much harder. That's, that's um, a dream. So I would be super stoked for that. Yeah, I yeah I, I sort of almost forgot about that, but that's a huge point. Yeah, I've, I've converted stuff for Xbox One and not a fun experience mm. uh, yeah so that would be awesome uh, but i was about to say earlier so y you're both touching uh both bruce and it's not about uh you know the world isn't there yet like in terms of internet speed and so on but do you think 5g might change this like it might that make higher internet speeds available to more people what do you think no yeah no. that would be possible like i th i think 5g is going to come out like kind of sidewind everything um, I guess it's still of an architectural thing where you need to have antennas for that and that needs to be built and, and, and whatnot. And I don't know what, what's easier, if it's easier to get accessible internet for the whole world or build that type of network everywhere. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think, you know, I think physics are always going to be involved there too, right? Like 
speed of light is only so fast and you, you can all, there's just latency inherent you know in, in sending signals over the air like that and you know i guess i guess we'll have to see how that trends out because just just because you can get a lot of download uh bandwidth to a client doesn't doesn't mean that you can get that uh you know latency that input latency into something that would that would really feel good um so i you know, bandwidth and latency are two different things. So I, I guess in my mind, the jury's still out on that. Maybe we'll yeah. all be streaming through uh, Starlink or something in, in <laughs> five years and everything will be, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I totally, I hear a lot of people who are not so super tech savvy sometimes who ask me like, oh, are, um, the 5 is gonna come, right? We don't need to invest in fiber and it's the super idea to draw it all the way out on the countryside. And I'm like, no. Like in the fi fiber is probably going to beat whatever they put up on the in the air for a few years for some time in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, we're going to move on now to talk about VR because we have to talk about VR when we talk about future tech. So, what do you guys think? Like, is VR going to be in everyone's living room in three years, or what is it going to look like? What do you think? I think I thought like that, like maybe for four or three years ago. I was really into VR at the launch of the Oculus, uh, the first Rift. And I have all the dev kits and I've tried so many things, but like, it, I've, I don't know, I, I hope, but I'm not so confident it will, it might take quite a bit until it's small enough and everybody's like, yeah, I can wear that. And that looks fun. And it's so minimum time to jump into it. Uh, not like strapping stuff and booting stuff, just like, pull up our glasses, then then it's fine. But until then, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical than I used to be. Yeah. But the, otherwise, the quest, the new quest, from uh, that's obviously a huge step in, in the right direction. Yeah. Definitely. What do you think, Snet and Bruce? Uh, I've always been super skeptical of VR, to be honest. Like even do, even during like that year when it was super super hype and everyone was like, "Yeah, VR is going to be the future," and like everything was VR. Uh, I was even like. I don't know about that, because uh, there are so many interaction problems that we still really haven't figured out, and it it also we have so many like years of uh, kind of the way we've designed games are based on the the interaction you have with the controller as a human, like you're you're interacting with the game via this interface that's been established for so long and now we have to like completely reinvent that and try to figure out new ways for it i mean it's not impossible that we do um because the same way can be said about the controller because the controller has also taken many iterations to where it's at right now uh, but like everything always boils down to at least in my opinion to like trends um and you know what what is accessible and VR isn't super accessible for everyone as of yet because you both need space and they're still kind of expensive. Um, and it's not like, you know, console really brought like made gaming accessible because it was you bought like a Nintendo or you bought a, an NES and, and, and that was it. You plugged it into your, your TV, which are, you already own, own a TV. Whereas with VR, it's like you need a good computer to run it. And if you did already, then you need to get the headset and the special, like, all this stuff for it. So, but I don't think, like, technically it won't be impossible because, like, there's already a bunch of good research on, you know, how to do the rendering and get away with, you know, make it optimized. Um, and it's just going to get better and better tech-wise. I'm just, like, not convinced about the, like, the human implication of it, I guess. Yeah, I, t I tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, the Quest 2 is is great to play around with. I, I enjoy playing around with it, but it's it's not really something that I could, you know, take take a long gaming session on, for example, uh, because it's, it's you know, for me anyways, in my, in my head shape, it's not quite as comfortable, you, you know, as I'd like it to be. It's a little bit heavy and, and whatnot. And then, it, yeah, you know, like we've used mouse and keyboards for decades right and then, then trying to interact with vr sometimes is is a little bit challenging uh, i'm super excited about the tech i i hope it gets better certainly you know i i think there's some great experiences that we could have there but i think it's probably still a little niche right now like you know i don't maybe in a couple of years but the the hardware 
and, and not just the rendering hardware, but the actual physical hardware you wear, like that's got to get better, I think, before it becomes more mainstream. Yeah, I definitely agree with, yeah. with what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I realized that when they released the uh, Oculus Rift that like there isn't, except for like headphones, the concept of having something strapped to your head like that, or it's like, I felt all um, th something that needs to be iterated on a lot, and then it's like build almost an ecosystem around it for like different lenses and and maybe different sh types of head straps and stuff like that. And before that, it's like a whole done deal, and everything works flawlessly. I don't think it's gonna take off as a super mainstream thing. Yeah, so I, I agree, totally. Yeah, we're all on the same page here. It's yeah. amazing. We have another question from the audience. Uh, how much adjustment is needed to make a game go multi-platform? So making a game compatible with, for example, Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. Do you want to start? Do you want yeah. yeah, I. It very much depends on the game. Like Battle Right, which I worked on trying to port, uh, we never came all the way um, for reasons. The, the, um, yeah, that was really hard because battery ride was just not a good, uh, easy to make control-wise on another. But technical, uh, it depends on the engine, so not the hardest thing, but really harder than you th think first time. Mm. Yeah. For for Overwatch, you know, I think it was we designed it to be uh, multi-platform right from the beginning, like we knew we were gonna ship on consoles. So we just made sure that that was, that was part of the design of the engine. I think um, it, was, it was harder for the UI designers and whatnot, because obviously the PC is very different than the consoles in terms of controls. And I think they, ha they had a, you know, quite a time there making that work. And then later when we ported to the Switch, you know, that's, that's a whole nother, uh, basically form factor for the UI that, that they had to design for. Yeah, I think you can definitely like plan for it early so that you like you save yourself time among along the line. Like if you want to port a game that was never intended for other platforms, it's gonna be much harder than if you, you think about it from the beginning, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good takeaway actually. I totally completely agree. It's uh, it's hard when it's uh, not thought about from a very early stage and then you like sho shoehorn stuff into different and you're always going to end up with a somewhat mediocre result if you don't really think about it hard. Yeah, and players can tell as well. Like if your UI is not made for PC, for example, it was made for consoles, people will tell and people generally don't like that. You know, uh, yeah. it's been some controversy of some games. I'm not going to mention the names, but uh, and also like when people feel like this is a mobile game, we are playing on PC. Yeah, that's nice. controversy as well. Yeah. Uh, so next question here. Do you think that PC will be dying? What's your, your take? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you can start. Okay, next question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any? <laughs> For me, it's just a no. I, I, I don't see why it would be dying, especially, don't, especially not since like there's so much stuff that like it is inherently sort of tied to a workstation PC. And like, and if you already have a PC, then you always and you're interested in creative stuff uh, for you because you build stuff with it uh, outside the gaming industry, maybe. But you know, you use it for creative stuff. Then you obviously you want to have some entertainment on it as well. And you know, there's always going to be an ecosystem around that because it's so open and so so much things that you can do with it. Yeah. So no. Yeah. Short answer no. But do you want to add on that, Slip Thurbers? Uh, it remind that question reminds me a little bit about there was a time when like games were rarely released on PC because console like the 360 era uh, kind of like games would go to console and it, sometimes you get a port to PC uh, and I I wonder if we're gonna get to that point again like if that will happen again uh, with like maybe the PlayStation 5 since like or uh, probably not the PlayStation 5 but maybe later down the line where like it will become more of a trend to only port games to console or something i don't know uh i don't think it's gonna happen um personally because it's it's also like playing on pc now is also a bit of trend like it's also uh like i wouldn't say it's cool to, to play on pc <laughs> but it's it's like most games always tend to be better managed on pc so to speak like a, like rocket league for instance i played that on console for a long time and then 
I learned that, oh, the PC version of Rocket League is much better because they can actually push that much faster because they don't have to go through the, the what was it called, the, like, the process of, of uh, quality assurance on, on console, which made them push patches much faster. And uh, that made me switch to PC because um, it is a much more open platform and it's much yeah easier to, like, not easier, but it's uh, definitely easier to handle like manage games on PC than it is. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we've heard, it seems like every decade someone says, ah, PC gaming is dying. And I think it's it's not going to die. And it's, you know, as, as long as people have to use Office and Word and whatnot on, on their laptops, even, or their desktops, you know, as as you say, they're, they're, they're going to want to play games. And I think, uh, you know, as long as that happens, PC gaming will be alive and well. And and then if you just look at the numbers too, like the numbers don't support that, right? Like people said, well, you know, mobile is going to steal a whole bunch of people who play PC games. And that's not not entirely true, right? Because the games that you play on PC, uh, if, if you're really into it, that's a unique experience that you can't get on some of these other platforms. You know, like if you're playing an MMO, for example, like World of Warcraft, you know, you're you're using your mouse, you're using your keyboard, you're typing a lot, uh, things like that, and you know that's just that's just hard to to replicate on a console. Uh, so, I, I PC gaming, I I am positive will be around for a long time to come. Yeah, the the because like the thing with if you're making a game for console, you can always play it on on PC because you can plug in a <laughs> controller and play it like that. Yes. If you're making a game that relies heavily on your keyboard then not so easy to play it on console. I guess the argument can be for mobile that like some interactions are way easier to to, to make for mobile. So like, but like you say, it's not going to be that it takes over that spot. It's going to be a different type of game that you're making for mobile. It's like, Absolutely. It's, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I think yeah, we are only adding platforms and adding stuff and never really removing uh, much of them. Like obviously some platforms die, but like, if there's one successful, they're probably going to be successful for a while. And PC is just like the OG and will <laughs> never get away from it. Or it never never go away. I yeah. mean, it's been there from the beginning of gaming, right? Like, yeah. s as long as there have been computers, there have been games pretty much. Because people started making games as soon as the internet uh, came around. Like, people started making, you know, uh, network-based games. So, like, I think... It's so rooted in the games and PC are so intertwined. I don't think people are going to keep having PCs but not play games on them. Exactly. So I, I just agree with you so much. <laughs> we have a few more minutes left, so we're going to sneak in some more questions. Um, so also when we talk about, we talked about a little bit of VR. So of course we also need to talk about AR, <laughs> so which was really, you know, uh, everyone was so excited about a few years ago. So like, where are we at right now with AR? Is it still exciting or what are your thoughts? What is it? I I hate to be boring here, or or you know maybe I don't know. I, I'm I'm pretty. I don't really see. I'm not too into it. I remember trying something at uh, uh, some somewhere uh, at a games convention or something, and I couldn't stop smiling because the UI and the latency was so bad. And the woman who 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 showed me. It, to it, he, she thought I was loving it, so she gave me a T-shirt, <laughs> and all, and I was just so confused to how this was a thing. Obviously, it was is much better now, but like that hasn't really triggered for me. Uh, I think it's a little bit too gimmicky. Uh, obviously, Pokemon Go, but I don't think I see that as like Pokemon getting. Um, getting out there and really not not AR itself. Yeah, and AR was a very small part of it. Yeah, like yeah exactly. It was location based, and you could use AR if you wanted to, and no one did. <laughs> exactly. Mm. So, what do you think, Sutton Bruce? I think um, I'm I'm actually more optimistic about AR than I am VR. I think uh, you know when I again, it's it's going to come down to the types of games that you want to make. But I really feel that there, there are some uh, concepts and ideas in AR, augmenting the world around you, uh, you know, gamifying it, that sure, maybe it's not going to be a whole first-person shooter game you, you know, that you're going to make in AR. That's fine. But, but I do think there's some experiences that are going to be very compelling. And we just need the hardware to get just a little bit better, I think. And, and I feel like 
I don't I don't know when, but I feel like soonish there would be a you know a breakout title where people are going to say, hey, that you know that's pretty cool, and and AR I think will then start to be a bigger thing. Yeah, so I've made AR games. Uh, <laughs> so I'm actually the other way around. I'm, I'm, I would be more optimistic for VR than AR, just because of how more, much more accessible the tools are right now for making VR games compared to making AR games. Uh, but that may change in the future. Um, and, and and certainly there are, like you mentioned, there are experiences that could be really cool in AR. Um, and in the same sense that, you know, there are experiences that'd be cool in VR. So I don't know, I, I kind of like put them in the same kind of box. I know that like when a year after VR kind of died out, people were like, AR is going to be the next thing. Uh, so it just feels like the same thing at the end. Uh, but I, I, it would be cool. Like there are certainly like the, all the, all the futuristic movies and whatnot, <laughs> when they're like interacting with the environment, like that stuff is really always what they showcase they're not showcasing someone sitting with a vr headset right like um so i, I think the techno like that technology is cooler than vr and it's much more accessible it, like the tool itself but right now it's kind of hard to make games for ar and you know that kind of that's the first step i think because i remember there was one plugin for unity specifically that just made ar so much easier to make but it was still a little bit of a hassle but it made it so much more accessible and it just exploded with like different tech demos for people made where they like made Tetris in the real world. And they, so, so it really comes down to what tools we have, um, more so I, I'd say than, than yeah, yeah. Tech or hardware also needs to be there. And it, like, I remember when Pokemon Go came out, I couldn't play it on my phone cause I didn't have, uh, like it wasn't savvy enough. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I really th the the accessibility of the dev kits and whatnot needs to to improve. And for VR, like Facebook are throwing money at it, and and like there are all these different big wigs that are making like VR technology. But I don't see much AR technology. Like maybe it's Microsoft that will do it or something. I don't know. It might come out of the blue and just like here's a super good solution to all those problems, and then that will make everything change. So yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I hope there's a lot of people who really like are excited about it because they are the ones that are needed to convince someone like me, and I really <laughs> want to be convinced. We need some champions. I mean, to Minority you. Report or whatever, when they have like this yeah. thing, I, I would love to have something like that really work well. That would be awesome. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see. We are running out of time, but I just want to close with: Do you have any final predictions for the future of mm -hmm. tech? Anything mm -hmm. you want to end this on? <laughs> Not any predictions, any mm. hopes for the future, maybe? What do you want to see in the future of gaming tech? I really, I might be a little bit part, um, yeah, not objective in this, but I really love to um, expand the performance wise uh, for uh, new developers or uh, in the studios uh, to have access to all the cores and all that stuff. And that's the thing I really looking forward and hope they're all pushing, everybody's pushing, even Unreal and everybody, so we can get like more juicy, cool simulations on all the cores and all the new tech platforms. That sounds excellent. Anything more to add? Yeah, I think uh, just making tools easier to use. Because I think Unity is a really good example of like they made games accessible to make for a lot of people. And the more people that make games, the easier, it's, like the more knowledge spreads and generally the more interest is generated from this. So just making things better will is the thing that I'm looking for. And that is happening all the time. Uh, but it, it's going to be amazing to see like the, the things that we thought, like this is triple a only, like only a triple a studio could make this. And then now it's becoming more like, no, this is just one dude making this game. Like that's going to happen more and more, I think. Uh, so the boundaries are going to get like, we're going to lower the threshold sort of where you need to start to make really high quality games. Yeah. I, I, I echo that both, both in hardware and the tool set, like any, Anything that we can do to get more people getting their ideas up on screen, because ideas inspire all of us, right? Like the more people that make those ideas, the more inspired we get. Uh, so just opening up that process to more and more people, like that gets me really excited for the future of gaming. Thank you so much. You're so hopeful, and I'm really looking forward to this this future that we're talking about. Uh, great answers. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, 
and a round of applause here from the audience.